Hello and welcome to Lab 13, Fluvial Geomorphology. This video is being provided to you as a tool to take you step by step, page by page through this lab. I find that these videos are quite helpful for those that are taking this either online or as a hybrid, or specifically just to come back to it to review how to do and deal with some of these complex topics. I'll also be providing some hints, tips, and some tricks to be able to work this lab efficiently and effectively. Now, as we can see, the learning objectives of this lab are to explain the relationship between stream flow and carrying capacity. We'll also be able to interpret a hydrograph and compare rural and urban hydrographs. We'll analyze a stream profile to determine how flow rates influence erosion and deposition, as well as calculate stream discharge. We'll identify the processes that create meandering streams, oxbow lakes, as well as waterfalls. We'll compare and contrast three different deltas. And lastly, we'll learn to analyze fluvial processes on topographic maps before and after dam removals. That being said, let's start Lab 13. So let's begin with part A. We know that fluvial, which means you know the study of running water and geomorphology being how we study how the earth changes, we're looking at how does water change the landscapes that we see. One of the first things that we're gonna take a look at is stream flow and carrying capacity. We, we learned that material is moved in running water and we can observe it in one of three ways. We can see it as a dissolved load, suspended load or a bed load. I often refer to these three pieces or these three ways of, of, of stream flow capacity as being like when you have a water bottle and you put the flavoring, the powdered flavoring, is that some of that will be completely dissolved within the water. You're not gonna be able to pull it out. It's completely been you know, dissolved in the water. Then you're gonna have some that's gonna be kind of floaties, the floaties that kind of you know, float along the top and float throughout. That's more suspended. You could pull that out if you want it. And then often you'll get what's considered bed load, which are the, the heavier class, the denser class that just sink straight to the bottom of your water bottle. So that's a, a way to envision uh, the way that stream flow and carrying capacity can be observed. Now, we can also learn down here in the bottom that bed load can move uh, by uh, a wave called saltation, which is uh, the temporary lifting and bouncing of material uh, along the bed flow, as well as traction, which is really the dragging or pushing or the creeping of those larger grained uh, materials. So the first question says, within this space, sketch and label a cross section of a river. Uh, so it can just be any design that you'd like. Uh, but represent and identify the dissolved, suspended, and bed load. Uh, be sure to include the definitions of saltation and traction as well. So, you know, right here we're, we're looking for a very simplified sketch of a river as if you could look down into the river. We want to be able to see how can you represent uh, visually really all five of these vocabulary terms. So the next step that we'll move into is called the Holstrom curve, which really shows the, it's a diagram that shows the size of the particles that flow in water and the velocity that is needed to move certain grain size material. So there are several factors that influence the flow speed of water. These can include the amount of water, the slope, uh, the shape of the channel, and we'll be exploring some of those as we move throughout this lab. So this diagram is what's next, the Hallstrom curve, which is really great. So we can see in this diagram that there's like pockets. We have a pocket for erosion, one for transportation, and then one for deposition. We also can see that it's been broken up into grain size. We know that clay is the finest, and then it gets a little coarser as silt, and then it becomes very coarse, which is uh, sand grain material, uh, which we can see is somewhere between you know less than 0.1 to a little over one millimeter in grain size itself. Things that you find at the beach, and then we get into really coarse grain material, which can be cobbles or even larger as rocks. So what we're able to identify here is, you know, looking at the particular flow speed or velocity of a river uh, broken up into cubic centimeters per second. So maybe it's something that's 10 cubic centimeters per second. It'd be along that line there. Uh, and then that being said, we can see that 
just depending on that velocity, we can then look at a particular grain size to see, you know, would it and could it move? And if so, what would it be doing? So if it was, as, you know, again, saying uh, 10 cubic centimeters per second, and maybe the grain size was one millimeter, that material would be transported. It would be moving away. Um, if it was perhaps uh, a little bit larger, maybe, I don't know, 10 millimeters in grain size, that would be material that would be deposited at that flow. So for question two, it's just having you look at this diagram in particular and answering some specific questions such as what is the minimum speed of water that would erode a clay sized particle or um, a sand sized particle or so on and so forth. Uh, letter E in particular is a little more complicated because it's just having you interpret it again but at different values so it says imagine that you're studying a river that's moving about one meter per second what material size would you expect to see that is eroding transporting depositing or even you know even bed load so it's having you look at you know first you might have to convert it the flow speed then it's going to have you look at those little pockets. Again, you know, this is our pocket for erosion, here's our pocket for transportation, and our pocket for deposition. So you'll be able to very easily answer those attributes. Which then brings us into hydrographs and storm events. So one of the factors that influence the speed of water in a channel is the amount or volume of water itself. During a storm event, the amount of water being forced through a channel can be quite significant. One way to understand the behavior of water in a channel during a storm event is by creating a hydrograph. So figure five, uh, sorry, 15.2 on the next page will illustrate two hypothetical hydrographs. One line will represent a hydrograph from a rain event in an urbanized or city landscape. The other will represent a hydrograph of the same rain event but in a rural or countryside landscape. So things that we're going to be able to identify first, we learned that stream flow is otherwise known as discharge, which is the volume of water moving over a particular point in a stream at a particular time. Uh, discharge is calculated at, you know, as being discharge, as Q, is equal to the area times the velocity of that stream at that particular spot in time. Another term that we're going to learn about is the duration of time between the peak rainfall and the peak discharge. That's called the lag time. So, you know, as an example, I always compare it to a bucket. If I'm out in the driveway with a big bucket and, I, and that bucket represents a rainstorm and I dump that bucket and I slide it down, you know, the driveway, all that water, you'll see that from, you know, the moment in which I discharge that water to the moment in which we have what's considered the peak, you know, the peak discharge, that nice little curve, like a wave of that bucket of water that's going down the driveway. The time from the, when I let that go to the point to when it reaches you, that's called the lag time itself. Uh, it says here, you will notice that the lag time for urbanized areas and rural areas can be significantly different. So let's go ahead and look at this next page below. So here's our hydrograph. Again, we're seeing that the gray line represents an urban or city landscape, and the dotted green line represents, you know, uh, the same type of storm, the same storm, the same volume of water, but in a different type of landscape. You know, really paint that picture for yourself. You know, why is it, how would water operate and how would it function in its process of erosion, transportation, and deposition with material on concrete versus on grass? You know, think about like when you spill a cup of water in a classroom. If the cup of water, if the, if the floor itself is tiled, the water just puddles there, right? Because it's been urbanized in a sense, right? But let's say that you are have an outdoor picnic and you spill a cup of water on the grass. It's not going to puddle there. It will be absorbed. It will infiltrate the soil. And so you're going to find that there's going to be some differences in those rates of just velocity itself. I mean, again, this graph here, this bar graph within the hydrograph represents the rain event. Then we can see that as we go over time, you know, this is time day one, day two, day three. This is a really large storm event and a very large river system that we're probably evaluating. Is we're able to see that immediately it peaks very high. You know, that the 
lag time is very short uh, for when you know the peak of the rainfall to the peak of the discharge. But what do you think slows this down? Why does it not peak as high? Why do you think it slows down? So question three, A through so on, says, you know, what is the approximate lag time for an urbanized area? What is the approximate lag time found in a rural area? It's having you really interpret this diagram. It's going to ask you a handful of questions about what you're seeing. Again, this, you know, this part here measures the blue bar graph, which is specifically the amount of precipitation in millimeters. We also have the time, you know, so this is taking us over a course of partially three days. And then we can see the amount of discharge me uh, measured in cubic meters per second. So we can quite, you know, see this example. Again, think about it. Concrete river channel versus a dirt river channel. What are the big differences? What would you expect to find? So we can move on to the next part. Uh, which is about checking it out more about America's rivers. So here is that QR code. Take a photo with your cell phone, or you can click that hyperlink. You know, it's if you're interested in learning more about the flow of America's river, the U United States Geological Survey, the USGS, has made some um, some videos that are quite you know exciting to watch when looking at how water moves, stream flow data, where it's collected, you know, how does it interpret into times of drought or in excess? How do we calculate the you know expectation of a flood? So it's very you know interesting. You know, there, there are this is a job on its own to understand, you know, just discharge velocity, looking at um, you know, again, living here in, in California. We've got the Los Angeles River. The Los Angeles River was a concrete channel. It was put in the 1930s. But the, the question is why? And the answer is because when it was filled with just dirt, when it was a normal old-fashioned river, it would overflow every couple of years because the amount of precipitation would exceed the area and the velocity that that channel could, over, you know, could withstand and would cause in incredible flooding. So that dirt kind of created friction, so it moved slower, it was able to overflow. So the Army Corps of Engineers created a concrete channel in which to get those flash flood waters away from the city and dump it faster and quicker towards the ocean. But nowadays, you know, more recently, we're removing that concrete channel, we're putting parks and walkways and there are ideas of putting a shopping event down in there. You know, it's because we haven't had a rainstorm like we've had you know, really since you know the early 2000s, but is that a good idea? And those are things that we get to study. Well, anyway, I digress. That being said, we wrapped up part A. Welcome to part B, stream profiles. In addition to just looking at velocity, another thing that we can look at is the profile or the longitudinal profile in which we look at really what happens with the slope or gradient between you know, the head where the stream begins and its mouth where it ends. So we can see here figure 15.3 shows a hypothetical longitudinal profile. It is, in essence, a graph showing the elevation of the river as it moves from the mountain all the way down to where it approaches perhaps the ocean, a lake, or a large body of water. So this is our profile here. Now, we're going to come back to this in a moment as we can see as we scroll a little bit down here. Uh, question four says, on that figure above, label where you observe the steeper slope and the gentler slope. So which side, the left or the right, has a steeper slope versus a you know, uh, gentler or less steep slope. Again, we can look here at this graph. The bottom shows the distance from the ocean in kilometers, and then, you know, going up and down, we can see there's the elevation in meters. Now, with different slopes, you will see different speeds of water flow. As we learned in the previous section of this lab, different speeds of water are directly related to erosion. Thus, river erosion is not the same through the entire course of a river itself. So we can actually begin looking down here at question five. It says, in what part of the river would you expect to see the greatest amount of erosion taking place? Explain your answer. Another word that we use for that is called incision, where rivers will actively incise or cut down. We often find that rivers cut in a V shape, where the energy is focused at the bottom and in the center, generally. 
we find that does and can change, uh, especially if the river is making a sharp turn, but we'll talk more about that later. Question six says, where would you expect to see the deposition of, this, of that sediment? Would you expect to see it at the top or the bottom, or what type of environment would you expect to find that? And lastly, question seven says, what happens to transported materials in a river once the river reaches the mouth? Uh, which is, again, flowing to a large lake, an ocean, or a body of water. What type of feature do you think is created? Explain your response in two or three sentences. Uh, hint, consider what feature is found at the mouth of most major rivers throughout the world. Uh, what we call that, essentially, you know, I'm not going to give you the answer on that. You can certainly find it. But when that material, whether it's being dissolved, suspended, or perhaps even uh, a bed load, uh, when it finally reaches a large body of standing water, it, use, it loses its energy. The, right, the stream stops flowing because it, it now enters into a uh, you know a still uh, water. But uh, we call it dumping its load. The, the river itself will dump its load and create a very distinct teardrop-looking feature. So something else that we can look at are called vertical profiles. That's another way of looking at it. Although it does not illustrate the movement of water through the entire course of the river, it does provide a clear snapshot at one specific location, as we can see in figure 15.4, another great diagram by our friend Scott. So what a vertical profile means is that if we were standing in the river and we wanted to look at everything, you know, just like when we looked at topographic maps and we drew a, you know, a cross-sectional profile, we do the exact same thing but in the river so we can observe it. So we can see the you know the active channel area itself, its flood a uh, floodplain itself, which is you know if it were to overflow, uh, that's where it would flow within. And then we can see the tops of the bank, both the left and right bank. So this is a very easy way for us to also observe. What's great about this is we can actually see the shape of the river. We can see that it's deeper uh, on one side uh, you know, deeper with less slope, and it's much steeper on the other side. So those are things that we can observe. So if I move on to the next piece, which is called, well, calculating uh, stream discharge, those profiles are actually quite helpful in understanding. So now hydrologists, or people who study water itself, want to learn how to calculate the most effective way of what discharge is. I mentioned it before, discharge, which the formula discharge being Q, is equal to the area, the active area of the channel, times the velocity. So this can be done by looking again at a cross-sectional profile. Uh, so it says here, to calculate the stream discharge, multiply the active channel by the flow rate, or the area by the velocity in which we see. So it says here, the active area of the channel times the velocity is equal to the discharge. So in this particular sample they're giving us, they're saying that maybe we measured this, this area, and we came up at 14 and a half square meters, and on average it's moving 1.4 meters per second, so therefore the discharge is 6.3 cubic meters per second. So it says, well, now you can try using that same formula that I've stated above. Assume that you were some classmates and you're surveying a stream itself and found that the active channel, the area itself, is about 7.6 square meters. And the average flow rate is 0 0.75 meters per second. So it's going to ask you, again, to solve that in two steps. Now, the USGS itself operates over 8,200 continuous record stream gauges that provide stream flow information from a wide variety of uses, including flood prediction, water management and allocation, engineering design, research, operation, so on and so forth. You know, as an example, I live very close to Lake Piru, and they actually measure the amount of water that enters Lake Piru at all times because it's technically a terminal lake, meaning that you know that's where the water ends from all of the surrounding drainage areas. But if we get a really big rainstorm, they need to be able to calculate the you know the discharge of the surrounding streams into what's going to be deposited in that lake, and so that way they can release the appropriate amount of water to avoid the dam itself from overflowing. Also, they want to be able to be accurate with those numbers so they don't release too much water and then we don't have enough for resources later on in the year. So we can move forward. Uh, we can see this is here. These are a hydrograph of three locations along the Mississippi River during a May 2017 flood event. So this is looking at daily discharge. So we can see that you know it goes from April 18th to May 15th itself. So. Um, Nonetheless, it says here that uh, the discharge data collected in this 
and this in uh, sorry at three stream gauges along the Mississippi River during May 2017 is shown on this diagram here. We can see that the green one is Memphis, the blue one is New Orleans, and the you know dark red is St. Louis. So it says the stream gauge data from Memphis. Tennessee is located at approximately 35 degrees north latitude. We find that the one in St. Louis is about 39 degrees latitude, and then we can also find that New Orleans is about 30 degrees latitude. So they're all at different latitudes along the Mississippi River. So what it's going to have you do is it's going to interpret this diagram to answer a handful of questions. So the first thing we can see is the daily discharge in cubic feet per second. We can also see the date itself over some period of time and the latitudes which are identified appropriately. So it says uh, for question 9, apply what you've learned. Review the daily discharge data prior to the storm event which occurred on April 28th. So we know that the storm occurred right here on the 28th. So we're looking at data pre-storm and post-storm. Uh, why might the daily discharge for the Mississippi River in St. Louis be much lower than the daily discharge for the Mississippi River at the Memphis or New Orleans location? Why do you think that might be the case? Again, I'll give you a hint. Latitude plays a huge role. Where are those locations located? Where along the river would that be located? Uh, question uh, B down here it says, on the graph, lightly shade in the dates when the storm precipitation was heaviest, which it says it was between April 29th and May 1st. You're going to draw a bar, a bar graph, you know, a little bar that identifies that uh, time in particular. Then, part C says, to describe the daily discharge curve, the line on the graph, for each of the locations from April 29th to May 15th. Describe what you see. You know, it's that, it's that idea of observation and interpretation. So after you draw your uh, your line, your bar graph right here, you know when we start seeing that you know the peak flow in the stream caused by that storm, interpret this. It's going to really take you back early to the lab as well, which is kind of cool. Uh, question D, E, and F again. Have you really look back now at the lag time like you did earlier in this lab? What did you learn about that? Compare how the discharge of the Mississippi River is different in certain dates, and then use your critical thinking skills. Wrap it all up together. Why do you think the daily discharge for St. Louis increased and decreased more rapidly than the daily discharge for the either other station that was provided? Explain your response in one or two sentences. Something that might be helpful. Check this out on Google Earth. Look at those locations on Google Earth. Maybe that might give you an idea as to what happens to the river or might help paint a different picture than just the observed graph itself. Now, if you would like to check out water uh, information system mappers, go ahead and scan that QR code or hit that hyperlink. You know, is there a stream gauge near you? Check out on the National Water Information System Mapper to locate the closest stream gauge to you. The next part here is looking at the floodplain itself, which says you will notice in figure 15.4 that uh, shown earlier in the lab, which 15.4, which we'll scroll up to here, 15.4 it's making reference to the floodplain on either side of the active channel. Let's scroll back down. Sorry, here we go. Um, that on, that on both sides of the river is a region referred to as the floodplain. As the name implies, these floodplains are the areas where water flows when the water level rises above normal. In some stream channels, these floodplains and banks are easy to identify. In others, though, such as the Sacramento Valley, these floodplains can be incredibly wide and also very rich for agriculture, which can also make them harder to identify. The wealth and the prosperity of ancient Egypt was due specifically due to the nutrient-rich sediment flooding from the Nile River each year. What's really interesting, as I digress very quickly, I'll tell you a quick story. You know, looking at archaeological sites along the Nile and looking at the distribution of populations over time, they could find that when would the, you know, when the river was uh, overflowing more uh, regularly and wider, that people were able to spread out farther away from the water and agriculture and grow you know, their produce and livestock and so on and so forth. But during times of drought, people would then move back closer to the river because the Nile itself would become you know, slightly desiccated, a lot drier or smaller. So we can actually see these changes in history, you know, and not just our like really long time ago history. Or, you know, and we still do the same thing today, which is kind of interesting when looking at these studies. 
Um, anyway, I digress. Just kind of, you know, putting it in there. So check out more about floodplains. You can scan that QR code or hit that hyperlink. You know, do you live in or on or near a floodplain. This is a great place to find out the Federal Emergency Management Agency, otherwise known as FEMA, has mapped out all the floodplains. So go ahead and see if you know your home is near a floodplain. So what's interesting is I live at you know on the top of a street and then about 10 houses away, my parents, I live about 10 houses away from my parents. They're in a massive floodplain. I'm not, but I'm only about 10 houses away. So, you know, why, why, you know, what are the things that we could take into consideration is why would they be in a drainage floodplain and why am I not? And that's because I'm on a, along a tributary or a smaller area that contributes to the main river that's down at the bottom of the street, which is part of the Santa Clara. So they're within the flood channel. I'm above it, so I'm okay. I don't need to have flood insurance. They do. <laughs> so that being said, as a city planner, uh, what do you believe is an appropriate use of the land? So this is taking us into what's considered uh, our critical thinking of, now you're a city planner. We're looking at a location of a 100-year floodplain. This designation suggests that the region statistically has a 1% of a flood of any given magnitude in a year. So a, uh, as an example, a 100-year floodplain can be interpreted as a 1 in 100 chance. So as a city planner, what do you believe is an appropriate use for this land? Why or why not? A landowner is proposing to build a house in a floodplain. Do you, do you approve those building permits? What extra requirements might you want to have them add into their features? Uh, what criteria are you using for these decisions? So if someone's living, wants to build a house in a floodplain that's been identified as a 100-year floodplain or a 1 in 100 chance that a major flood of any magnitude could happen in, a, in any given year. Should homes be built there? Now, immediately, I'm just going to be, I'm going to think that you're going to say no. <laughs> but we do it all the time. The Santa Clara River, you know, where I, out where I live in Santa Clarita, you know, we, they're building brand new communities. It's called trestles. You got to go over the bridge to go into the river valley itself, into the floodplain. And they're building new schools and apartments and condos and houses. We do it all the time because they, you know, people think this 100 year floodplain statistic is not in their favor. It's, oh, it's not, it's one in 100 chance, not a big deal. But it is, <laughs> because if you don't have it this year, you still have odds of it happening next year and the following year. Anyway, after you kind of put yourself as being a city planner and you're deciding whether people should build homes and floodplains, that will wrap up part B. So welcome to part C, rivers shaping the landscape. So this is where we really get to uh, apply the terms that we learned that we learned before erosion transportation and deposition one of the first things that we'll talk about is meandering streams now a meandering stream is when a stream is able to actually go between you know the uh, banks or the you know, within the floodplain itself where it zigzags back and forth it meanders from wall to wall you know I often think of just this idea is if I had a, a really long narrow table and if I had the table very steep and I poured water down, you know, it would go very quickly in, you know, at a higher velocity down to the bottom of the table. But as I slowly change the slope and make it more, almost, almost flat, and I pour water out on that table, the water would kind of wiggle back and forth, right? And that's what we call a meandering stream. So it says here, uh, once a river descends down to a lower valley, the flow rates of the water tend to vary within the active channel. We'll observe that on the next page. So figure 15.7 uh, on the next page is a great example of that. This is the velocity of a stream as it depends on whether the channel is straight or curved. What does that really mean? Okay, so we've all been in a car and we've been driving very fast in the fast lane. But what happens when you make a sharp turn? say a left-hand turn. Well, all the groceries and people in the back seat get thrown to the right because they were still in motion. So even though the car is moving, those items were still in motion and they're gonna go the opposite direction. Well, that's what we find happens in river systems. So notice this arrow, this, these arrows are showing the direction of flow. But it gets, you know, as the river is going down and making a sharp right-hand turn, much of the energy is thrown to the outside, which is what's going to make it much deeper. So we find this, what we call the talweg. The talweg is the deepest and fastest part of river systems themselves. So it's going to be actively eroding here. Well, as it's eroding this material, that material is going to get deposited on the outside of a curve later on down the stream itself. 
Now, as we can see with letter A in that cross profile, we can see that the fastest velocity is focused in the center. Center top about seven tenths from the top of the water. So that's because the river is going straight. But as soon as that river changes its course and starts to turn, it begins to erode. What's neat is that over time it will continue to erode and erode and erode until it makes very, very large curves and may cause the river to make mass. Once it's already started in motion, it will continue to make those curves forever. And what's really interesting is it doesn't take a whole lot to change the direction of a river. It could be a large boulder. It could start changing the direction in which that river will operate and create different types of curves within it. So anyway, question 11 says, refer to the river channel diagram labeled B in figure 15.7. On which side of the river would you anticipate more erosion? On the outside turn or on the inside turn? Question B says, on which side of the river shows, shown in example B would you anticipate areas of deposition? And apply what you've learned and what I've stated above to answer the last part of that question. Uh, you know. If this were to occur over a great deal of time, what change would you anticipate for the path of the river? Now, the idea of uneven erosion and deposition of either side of a river channel is exactly what will create that meandering stream. Figure 15.8 below illustrates the speed of water in a channel as it responds to turns in the course of a river. So let's go ahead and scroll down to that one. Here we can see we can find that as the river is flowing, it bounces you know, back and forth. So we see an area of erosion. This material is eroded and deposited here in a point bar. This cut bank, this area of erosion, is going to be pulling material here and depositing it here on this point bar. So we're able to really observe these different areas of erosion and deposition. Over time, they will continue to grow and grow out. And what's interesting, um, that when looking at these curves in a stream, uh, it's very much like, I, you know, we always compare it to fractals, like uh, fractals within um, like a snowflake and how that there's specific patterns and designs for each snowflake, is that these curves, because of this ricocheting motion, that they actually, there's a pattern and a distance that you can actually predict how far down the stream the next curve should be, which is pretty cool. So it says, as the river turns, the outside of the turn is referred to as the cut bank, which is known as a point of erosion. Uh, that being said, on the inside turn, where the water flows more slowly, we would call that as a point bar. They can be called a sandbar, a point bar, or a gravel bar. Point bars are those classic areas where grandpa and grandson or granddaughter are out there and they're fly fishing and they're sitting on that little beachy sand area on this very slow moving river. And they're opposite of that of the deepest, fastest part of that current. If you're a fish, and you wanted to get through here, you would follow the towel bag or you'd follow this line here to get out of there quickly. Now, these curves continue to, you know, to occur uh, over time. They can become deeper and wider and so on and so forth you know, across the landscape. But one of the features that can be developed from that is called an oxbow lake. So at times, the river cuts through and part of a turning loop becomes cut off from the rest of the course. So maybe at some point the river will shoot through, C-H-U-T-E, will shoot through this location abandoning this part of the channel. If it has water in it, we'll call that an oxbow lake. If it becomes dry, we can call it an oxbow or a meander scar itself. So let's see what that looks like in a diagram. Here the same diagram we're looking at, that much richer deeper curve, look at nice big bellowing, and then all of a sudden it sh there's a chute that occurs, water finds the path of least uh, resistance and travel, cuts through, and abandons that channel at, and the river itself. So let's take a virtual field trip to a meandering river. So it says using Google Maps or Google Earth, navigate to the following coordinates along the Sacramento and Butte County, California. Turn on the satellite view, zoom out to an extent where you can see several of the bends in the river. So once visiting a map, you're going to be able to observe these changes. You're going to be able to see what happens over time and you'll see that there are meander scars of ancient time in many of these areas throughout the world. It's then going to ask you to do uh, something very quickly, uh, which is not a lot of space right here. Uh, in yours, it's bigger, sorry. Uh, it says in the area provided below, sketch a pathway of what the Sacramento River, where the river is flowing in the upper right, 
corner, making that significant turn to the left or the west side and eventually flowing up the bottom of the south. So it's asking you to draw what you are seeing. And it's also going to have you then identify areas that are point bars, cut banks, and so on and so forth. It's even going to ask you to identify even potential oxbow lakes themselves. So you'll be able to draw that in the space that's going to be provided here in your copy of the lab. So then we move forward and look at waterfalls. So in the previous labs, we've explored different you know, aspects of rock structures. When a river is flowing over different types of rocks, the ability of the rock and the river itself to erode will vary. Some rock is very hard and resistant to erosion, while other layers may be softer and more prone to erosion. Many waterfalls occur at the boundary of these two layers. So note that we have that here in this diagram being expressed, figure 15.11. Uh, we can see that we have a harder, more uh, resistant or resilient rock, and maybe something softer. Maybe a harder rock would be like a basalt, the softer rock could be a sandstone, and then you have a river that's overflowing. The softer rock is able to erode quicker than the harder rock, thus you know, of creating a ledge or a waterfall itself. So question 18 says, refer to figure 15.11, and based on what you know about the erosional process in waterfalls, would you anticipate that the waterfall moves upstream or downstream. So do you think that this waterfall will continue to work its way upstream or will it slowly move downstream? And answer question 18 there. So then uh, the last part of C is to look at deltas, which is uh, something we've talked about a little bit earlier without really saying the word. So it says, through this lab, you've learned the influence of water movement, specifically in regards to erosion, transportation, and deposition. A faster moving water erodes and transports, while slower water can cause deposition. But what happens when a river completely stops moving? Well, that material is being, you know, it gets deposited, it, the river itself will dump its load and create this very unique uh, teardrop shape, which is otherwise known as a delta, the triangular teardrop shape. So again, one more virtual field trip. Perhaps the most iconic of all deltas is where the Nile River flows into the Mediterranean Sea. Now using Google Earth or Google Maps, navigate to the following coordinate. Turn on the satellite view, zoom out so you can see all of Cairo to the south and the Mediterranean Sea to the north. Now, based on the color of the region, what do you suspect in the mainland, uh, suspect in the mainland use of the region? And what is the overall shape of that area? Zoom out further. What is the land coverage for most of the surrounding region? So you're going to continue to kind of answer these questions based on what you observe. So you'll continue to look at that until you get to question 20 that says one of the country's most iconic waterways is the Mississippi River. The Mississippi flows into the Gulf of Mexico very close to New Orleans. Using Google Maps or Google Earth, let's navigate to the following location. It gives you the latitude and longitude. To get a full view of the Mississippi River Delta, zoom out until you see Biloxi to the east side and Baton Rouge to the north and Lafayette on the west. What is the overall land use of this area? What patterns do you see that might be either similar or different to what you saw in the Nile? And then wrapping that up about the Gulf of Mexico is prone to hurricanes and significant storm surges. There are extremely high waves that result from strong winds and a hurricane. What influence would the Mississippi River Delta have on a storm itself? Why do you think it might be important to the Gulf Coast cities such as New Orleans and your response should be two to three sentences in length. And then the last part here is looking at question 21. Now let's come back to California. The Central Valley has two major rivers, the Sacramento from the north and the San Joaquin from the south, that converge further inland. This is due to the coastal range and several bays between the rivers and the Pacific Ocean. This type of delta is unique and is referred to as a reverse delta because the sediments are deposited further inland rather than eventually in, as a body of water or into the ocean itself. Using Google Earth or Google Maps, navigate to the following location and zoom and again walk through those processes. Now, once you've completed your California version, it's going to have you wrap up by looking at, you know, a compare and contrast of all three of those types of things that we looked at. You looked at the Nile, the Mississippi, and the California Deltas. What are some similarities that you observed? What are some differences that you observed? And be sure to wrap that up in two to three sentences each. And that being said, we wrapped up Part C. 
Welcome to Part D, the case study of the Elwha River. For millennia, the Elwha River ran wild, connecting mountains and seas in a thriving ecosystem. The river provided to be an ideal habitat for the sea run of fish with 11 varieties of salmon and trout spawning within its waters. This river was incredibly important for the you know, eco-habitat, but then as we move into the 1900s, they ended up creating what was considered a hydroelectric plant to generate electricity off of the waters themselves. However, construction of the dam blocked the migration of the salmon upstream, ultimately disrupting the flow of the sediment as well, causing uh, flooding of historic homelands, cultural sites, and so on and so forth. So what we're going to be able to do is look at some different time periods of this river and analyze what were the effects of damming it and now, really, now that they've undammed the river, what are we looking at as some form of restoration? So as you kind of work through this, it's giving you some examples of its location, where it was found, a little bit more about its history, the amount of material that was being moved, you know, again, eroded at its source, being transported down to its mouth, and so on and so forth. So you'll learn more about that history, and then it has you looking at some different attributes, uh, you know, the, the size comparison of the amount of sediment that would be moved, so on and so forth. So it says first, let's use a topographic map to explore the morphology of this area. If you need a quick review, or it says to go ahead and click on this link here, which will open up this window right here, where it kind of gives you a background again on topo maps. Also lets you look at some of uh, the, you know, the codes. You know, the symbols and designs that are found on maps really, you know, interpret what we're not able to see in a real life experience because we're looking at a paper map. So it gives you, you know, racetracks, the colors, the cuts, the fills, so on and so forth. So lots of great resources that are here. Then once you wrap, oops, wrap up that part, it says, oops, let's go to the Google Drive and let's access the map of this area. So we can do that here. As you can see, uh, this is the Olympic National Forest. And it says that you're going to be able to use the plus and minus signs if you download this uh, onto the Word doc, I mean, to the uh, PDF viewer. You can do that as well. You can zoom in you know, incredibly because it's a high quality PDF. So you can do that. Uh, and it's going to ask you to interpret that map. It's going to say, where does the Elwha River flow to the north or to the south? How can you tell? These, again, this is like taking us back to lab two. When, you're going, when you had to interpret a topographic map, looking at elevations, looking at slope, you know, remember the contour lines, the closer they are together, denote that there's a, a mountain or at least a steep slope of some sort. If you need any references, I've shared some videos below this one uh, to kind of take you back on how to interpret these topographic maps. So again, looking at the contour lines, the elevations, you know, looking at the colors that were used to interpret that and to observe what we're seeing. So it's going to ask you a handful of questions. Um, then it's going to have you click on another link. So this first topo map is looking at it post dam. And then this one is looking at the same area post dam removal. So it says to access the topo map from 2020 after the dams were completely removed. This is a larger file, might take a few more moments. Now you're going to compare and contrast the map that you originally had, which was from 1950, to the map that is brand new coming out of 2020. And you'll go ahead and work through those steps. And then it says to also at your last part here for 28 is, you know, search the internet f to find out how many dams, dam construction maintenance projects and dam removal projects are where you live. You know, do you, are you dealing with anything like that? You know, maybe, maybe not to its size or magnitude, but do you have any regulation that's being used to maybe generate electricity? Maybe it's being used to store water. You know, like again, I live in Santa Clarita. We've got, within my little area, we've got Lake Piru. We've got two Castaic Lakes, an upper and a lower. We've got Pyramid Lake. We've got the Bouquet Reservoir. We've all these different areas in which we are entrapping that water. But we're also entrapping that sediment. And there's a lot more to it that's more political and things along those lines. But that is a crash course in understanding how rivers erode, transport, deposit, and change our landscapes today. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, be sure to comment below. Don't forget to like and subscribe while you're at it, and I'll see you on the next lab.